Uh, last uh, Wednesday night, group met together on um, uh, an endeavor that we're looking to begin in September called, uh, it's a, the idea of dinner church, feeding people and ministering to them uh, in our area. And um, just want to let you know that, um, that Ryan and Jenny are going to be the pastor. They're, they've taken that responsibility over, and uh, he, Ryan has had a, always had a heart for, uh, for our city here and led uh, High Pope last year and and it's been a blessing to us, and, and Barb's going to be assisting him in that, and we're just looking forward to see what we can do to continue to uh, touch our, our, uh, our neighborhood. Um, last week, we talked about blessed are those who are persecuted, and, and we indicated that actually this is the only bad beatitude that has a double blessing to it. And so I want to just, for just a few moments this morning, because we've got a very important announcement and some information that we want to give to you, but I want to give you a little overflow, I call it an addendum, but of, of some of the things that, that came out of that study for me, and even part of the, 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 the worship service, the song that we, we sang about being in the fire, just really opened up, and I want to unpack a little bit of that to, uh, this morning. But it says in Matthew chapter 5, and if we can go back uh, there, it says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, Jesus said. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And what a, what a challenging beatitude. It, when we are persecuted, we would say, just get me through this. Uh, to, to be encouraged to, to rejoice, uh, encourage, uh, I think Luke's account of this says, leap for joy. And I'm thinking, Sure, but there is something that happens to us when we are serving Jesus, and this is really an overflow of a life that represents the Lord. Because if we, if we are poor in spirit and mourn and hunger and, and, and go after mercy because we want to be merciful and we want a focused heart and we want to see peace in our world, God's peace in our world, it's not readily received. It would seem like it should be, but it's not readily received. And persecution arises as a result of that. But our response, as we mentioned last time, is really twofold. Because what I, what I said is, and, and what I uh, indicated, it, you know, in, the, in, in looking at these verses, is that there are those who are being persecuted and how true that is. And the word to them that Jesus gives is that to, I'm going to be with you and I want you to rejoice. I want you to know that we're going to be closely linked together. Once again, I was heartbroken as I read just yesterday, the day before, on a pastor just earlier this month uh, that in Nigeria that the radicals came in shot him, killed his two sons, and kidnapped his daughter. And uh, fortunately, just last week, they did release the daughter after a, um, a ransom was paid. He has been wounded. He's a, but it, just for being a believer. And that's just one of the many stories that, uh, that are taking place in, in our world even as we live right now. There is no way that a person can rejoice in a situation like that unless they truly have, in the core of their being, the joy of the Lord. Because only God can give that kind of strength. Even as the song implied this morning, there's a grace to be found. There is a grace to be found in the difficulty. And then I, 
I, I mentioned, what about those of us who live in this country and, and perhaps not to that level of kind of persecution that is being experienced? And my, uh, my counsel there is that we want to be grateful for the opportunity. We want to do the best we can for the opportunity and that we want to be, we want to serve, we want to give, we want to give glory to God. And both of them, in both of these situations, the gold is glory. And I simply put it like this, be joyful in one, be grateful in the other, and let it be, let it be seen in their lives. But there was something that I found as I was working through this, a statement that was said that just gripped me. I call it just a, a, a principle, it's just this principle that I, I, I discovered. That, and it's found in the story of the three Hebrew children. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Most of us who, who uh, are familiar with the Old Testament and Daniel know the story. And, and I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a cute story, but it is a dead serious story. And as I was looking at that again, I, I was somewhat overwhelmed with, with this statement that I, that I want you to consider, this principle that I want you to consider this morning. That, that there is, and it's almost... Uh, unimaginable, but yet it's so true. And, and it's wonderful and encouraging, but there is fellowship in the fire. There is fellowship that we can have with God in the fires that we face in our lives. And I mean, for them, it, this was really over the top. And I, I want you to think for just a moment with me. Before we look at the story, I want you to think about just that statement, fellowship in the fire. Having the presence of God, knowing the presence, recognizing and experiencing the presence of God in the fire. You know, life happens to all of us. And, and, and some of you, the heat just got turned up. In some of your situations, it really got turned up seven times because it's, this was not where I expected to be in the month of July. This is not where I expected to be right now. And, and, and I want you to know that in the midst of that, I promise you, there is a God. <clears throat> That's right there. That's right there. And there is a fellowship that is beyond what we could even imagine or think. And that fellowship does something, sustains us. And so, when I thought about this, the, the, the question comes to my mind, who, who's in control anyways? Who's in control of all of this? You know the book of Daniel, you know that this story of the three Hebrew children, we call them children, young men, and probably much older. This, is, this could be as much as 15 to 20 years after they were uh, taken to Babylon in chapter 1, and now we're in, we're in chapter 3. These young men, in Daniel chapter 3, were faced with an incredible challenge. I don't know what all the other people who were doing in the, in the kingdom at that moment, how they were responding to this demand from the king and command from the king, but we do find out about these three. You know that King Nebuchadnezzar had built a, uh, an image, kind of stems from the dream of chapter two. He, he builds this massive image and requires his nation, his people to bow down. Now, because he was over so much territory, there'd been, there'd been some uh, localized element to this, to this event that was taking place. And if you didn't bow, you, you remember what the story says. If you didn't bow, you went into the furnace. That's the way it was going to be. And these three young men said no. And they were brought 
before the king. And these are the words that they said. This is, this is what we read uh, as they were answering the king. Now, we may have those verses on there. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego replied to him, that's King Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Something was settled in them in a moment. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. Oh, we like that part. <laughs> and he will deliver us. That's the faith that they had. From your majesty's hand. Still measure of respect to the king. But if he does not, but if he does not, we want you to know this, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of God that you have set up. Image of gold that you have set up. Now we got to pause for a moment and think about the, the, what's going on, what happened, what had to be settled in these young men's life at this, at this time. See, they had already determined that they were all in. They couldn't determine they were all in when all of a sudden everybody's got to bow. Man, I don't know what I'm going to do. Somewhere in the past... These young men said, no matter what, God, I'm all in. I'm all in. They didn't know what all in meant. But when the crisis came, they knew that they were all in. All in. I say that to say this, church, and this is for all of us from platform to chair, from back to front, from side to side. We all have to make a decision. We all have to decide if we're all in. Because we will be pressed, some more than others. And the temptation to compromise is going to be there. And sadly, in the midst of that compromise that can take place, some will back away and say, it's a little too hard. It's a little too difficult. Because if we never go all in, when we face something, how are we going to handle it? Now, there are differences, and I am working on a, a message for the future on Strong preferences and versus convictions. There are some convictions that we must have as believers that are non-negotiable. We all have some strong preferences in this room. Things that are, we just don't do. But there are some convictions that we must have. These three young men had a conviction that they would not bow to any other God until, excuse me, only the God that they served, loved, and knew. So what happens? You, you know the story of what takes, took place. The king got beside himself the language is very strong. It's almost as if you could see it on his face. You know, he just became so angry. How dare anybody challenge me? And of course, he gets some of his best men, heats the thing up seven times more, and they throw them in. And you knew what happened. You know what happened to the, the men that cast them into the fire, that it was so hot that they died immediately from, from the flames. They, they, 
Those that put them in there didn't make it. Now, there's a lot of miracles in the Bible that are stunning. And anything God does is just marvelous, you know, in our thinking. But there's just a couple of them that I cannot get my arms around. I can't get my arms around because I, I have no place to put them. I can't. Uh, this one and, and God stopping the sun for a day or the sun standing still for a day. I, I don't even know where to put those things. It, you can't. That can't. How? And how can somebody be thrown in the fire and not be consumed instantly? You, you better do your praying before you're getting thrown in, okay? <laughs> because it's going to be too late when, 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 when you've when you're been taken up the steps and, and, and being placed in, 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 into the fire. No time. No time. But they were not consumed. But the message I want you to capture, what I want you to capture is this. When the king looked in, he says, he leaps to his feet. Amazement. And he says, hey guys, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly your majesty. He said, look, I see four men, catch this, walking around in the fire. Now, if I'm you, or I'm them, or if it's me, I'd be saying, you know, as soon as we get out of here, it'd be fine by me. The last thing that I would be thinking about is to walk around in the fire. First thing I'd be thinking about is get out of this. I don't know how we've made it, but let's get out of this. But there's something that's going on here that is so big and speaks to us in a way that is, that is so rich, church. So rich. Because all of us go through and face things in our life, some more uh, devastating than, than others. But, but, I, but I want you to... to to, to capture this, it just screams at us. If, if, I can, if I can say it like this, this screams at us that, that even in the midst of a furnace seven times hotter, you can walk around in the, in, and not be affected by it because there's somebody else with you. Somebody else. Now the king didn't know Jesus. He didn't know God. It says son of God or it, translations, you know, say one like the sons of God. But we realize it, that, that it, it was who it was. Uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the idea is that the, the, the king didn't know Jesus at that time. It, and, and, but yet it was, it was uh, the Lord. You need, anyone doing the study knows it, what we call a Christophany. That, uh, that took place, Jesus being revealed in the, in the Old Testament. You know what had happened? They, the king called them out. <laughs> uh, that's it's too much, okay? I don't know how to handle that. But the fellowship is so rich, and it's not like we're, we're morbid. We're, we're so caught up with the presence of God that we, we just eventually get let out and, and, and we're okay. And, but we enjoyed the fellowship. They were walking around in a fire because there was another in a fire with them. And that fellowship was so powerful, so strong, that they could do. And it doesn't always end up that you don't smell like smoke. It doesn't always end up that there are not some scars. It doesn't always end up like that. But let me tell you how it ends up. 
it always ends up with you with him. Always. Always with you with him. One last thought. This is so captivating to me. Nebuchadnezzar knew these young men to some degree or another. They served in his kingdom probably for 10, maybe 20 years. They knew they were hard workers. He probably was aware that they were steady, hard workers, had integrity. But hear me. And this, is, this to me is incredible when I think about it. The king didn't see Jesus in their life until they were in the fire. When Jesus is in your life in the fire, others will take notice. Because you don't act like everybody else. And they say, something's going on in their life. No, it's not something that's going on in their life. It's someone is in their life with them. Through the fire. No wonder we are saying when we serve Jesus in difficulty, the world looks at the compromising church today and it's weak and it's anemic and they say anything goes... And they're not challenged by those, those churches. They're not challenged by that kind of fellowship. They are challenged by a fellowship that says, this we believe. And this we will stand for. There's another in the fire. And people will see it. They will see when you're in pain. What a difference it makes. This last week, you probably saw in the news um, that one of our one of the churches, the ministries in our city, Simple Street Ministry, was just devastated by vandal. They think it's just one person. And it's it, it was sad enough of what they did the first time, but they broke in, if you followed the story at all, broke in the second time. Now, some of our members have had contact and know uh, Joel, who uh, um, l- runs the, the, the Simple Street Ministry, and he has this baptism tank that uh, we have seen and, and, and watch people get baptized in in different events around our city. They really have made havoc of this building. But I want us to, to make a statement that we care about some of our people who are being persecuted, in our city. In a simple way, I can relate to that. Before I came here, in Detroit, we were picking up some people in our vans, and the person, one of the girls we were picking up, their boyfriend didn't like it. And so he burned our van down to the ground and spray painted our other van, our other van, and then probably was the one who made a threat on the pastor's life. It wasn't a serious one, but it, we, we took it seriously. But, you know, here he is trying to minister. All, these, all Joe is trying to do is help people. And the enemy doesn't want that to happen because he knows it's going to be good for those who are hurting. And so right now I'm going to ask my ushers to get themselves ready. We're going to take an offering, all right? We're going to take an offering. In fact, I just wanted to do it differently. And, and ushers, you be ready to help. We're going to, I just, uh, I want Joel to know, we're contacting Joel at this moment, uh, and uh, he, he's, he's serving uh, in, in, a, in a church, helping the church, who has who is, uh, helped sponsor the Simple Street Ministry. He's on security, and, he, and he's there. Hi, Joel, this is Pastor Brown, and I just want you to know we're going to take an offering for you right now, all right? And um, we just want you to know we care about you, and we want God's best for you, and uh, listen... I don't know how much it's going to come in, but I want you to know, at least you can feed people some pizza and and some pop and chips while they help clean up your place, okay? Amen. 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 So, look, 
I'll, uh, I want, I'll, I'll put the first hundred dollars down here. All right, you got an offering. We're just going to bless. And ushers, you just come. If people want to, I want you to come. Just put it up here. We want, we, I want you to respond. Just, I, if it's pennies, I don't care. We just want to say, I'm going to bless you. I want to bless you. I want to bless you. I want to bless you. And if you, you want to give online, go to our site and do young adult. We're working on developing a love offering uh, a tab that we can use, but we don't have that in operation yet. So just put it on there as, um, and the check should be made out to Bethel and put Simple Street on it, if you would. And we will, um, we will be a, a blessing to and an encouragement too. And if you need help from one of the ushers, I'd be glad to do it. Uh, but we just, we just want you to know, and if you can just take a quick picture of that and send it to Joel and say, Joel, um, there's, a, there's a, a sister church that loves you and loves what you're doing in this city. And we, uh, we care. We care, we care, we care. Hallelujah. And... Um, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Joel, you say thank you. I just want to thank you all very much uh, for your for your support, for your prayers. Um, you know, this has been a trying time, uh, but I know that God will be glorified through it all. And uh, we just, uh, we're going to see to it that uh, souls are one, lives are changed, and communities are transformed to the glory of God. And I mm-hmm. uh, just thank, I thank God for, for ministries like yours and the congregants. And uh, I thank you, Pastor, for, for just being obedient and doing what you feel led to do this morning. I appreciate it greatly. You are very, very welcome. I'm going to ask a good friend of yours, Joe Koning, to uh, pray. Uh, he is the offering prayer person today all right and so joe you have worked with him and know him personally yes dear father we come to you and thank you uh, for this opportunity that we have to come alongside our friend and and fellow warrior and lord we just ask that uh, for him and his ministry uh, while it's it has been going strong and lord it has been impacting people's lives and communities, that in a sense, this might be a turning point, Lord, that uh, it would even, through the whatever uh, news reports they've gotten, whatever uh, has happened uh, in, the, in the lives of those that are working in the ministry, that new and more things, the Lord, more outreaches, more, more lives would be touched, souls saved, and yes. Lord, you glorified. So, Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We just ask that you continue to watch over Joel, watch over all those in the Simple Street Ministries, those that support him. Watch over them, protect them, and guide them, use them for your glory and your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.